Wow. Wow. A standing ovation. I wish it hap would have happened after I spoke. Then it would have it been will. really impressive. <laughs> but thank you so much. I hope you got an all, a good, great stretch for all of you. So I have to tell you that I am nervous following Mary Hart. <laughs> she is absolutely the smartest chick that I know. Female, if you're offended by the word chick, I'm sorry. It shows my age. She's the smartest one that I know. And to follow with those lightning lips, I don't think anybody can keep up with that. And if you haven't heard her story about why they call her lightning lips, you need to ask her because it's really a great one. So one of the things that Jim said just before I came up here is that you're either a borrower or a lender, right? And some people are both. And I can tell you there's a lot of people that are both. And that needs to be your goal too, is to be both. Because when you know both sides, you're gonna make money on both sides. And that's what we're gonna talk about today is how to be successful on both sides, whether you're the borrower or the lender. Let me, uh, and, and I apologize in advance if I have to turn around and look at my slide, okay? So what I want to do is I want you to follow in my footsteps, but what I also want you to do is avoid the piles of poop that I've stepped in because I've stepped in a lot of them, and I'm sure there will be plenty more that I will step in. I hope to avoid them just like you do. I've had to replace a lot of shoes, but we'll just do what we can here. So, hard money. <laughs> I am in this company with my brother. Is anybody in business with a sibling? No? You are? Good, good. Well, I'm in business. I see someone else with her brother too, Lori and her brother in business. Was that your brother? <laughs> so, so I'm in business with my brother Bill. He is one of the nicest guys that I know. I have, I have, we're from a family of five kids, and he's the oldest. He is older than me, even though he looks younger. He really is older than me. He's got that Dick Clark look. Some of you younger people won't know what that means, but Dick Clark looked like he was 30 his entire life. And he was from American Bandstand, in case you don't know what that means either. So, so he, he's a great guy to be in business with. I'm very blessed to have him as my partner. Uh, there's no one on this earth that I would trust more to be in business with, and it's great that we can get in each other's faces and that our mom can settle it for us later. So <laughs> it works out really, really well for us. And everybody can be a lender. Um, I really got into this by accident, and I'm going to tell you exactly how I do this. You don't have to have big money to get into this business. You don't have to have any money to be a lender at all. You can use other people's money. We heard uh, Nate talk earlier today. He was talking about how much money is in the IRA or, or in IRA custodian companies. What did he say? Thirty trillion? Is that what he t what he said? I actually have thirty million dollars of other people's self-directed IRA money. That's, that's without going into the fund. That's just one-off money, and I raised it one person at a time. One person at a time. You can do this too. So one of the things that we do as a company is we lend to people that we know, like, and trust. And you heard Mary say that earlier. It's really important to lend to people that you know, like, and trust. I like to get my loans paid back. How about you? I'm not in the flipping business because I, like Mary Hart, suck at it. I don't have to, who's got time for that? And you have to worry about what so many people are doing. And like she said, it looks pretty, but I'm just not good at it. I'd rather watch it on Home and Garden TV and believe the, the fake profits that they get. Um, <laughs> I mean, how do you buy a house and flip it when you have a 10% equity in it and you still walk away with a profit after paying your real estate agent. I don't get it. But they do it in California all the time. Um, so the profit for us as a lender and the profit for you as a lender really is in the points that you charge up front. It's not in your interest rate because you never know how long that loan is really going to go. Sometimes that loan will last three months. Sometimes it lasts 12 months. Sometimes it'll last a year and a half. But the return that you're really getting on your money is the points that you charge up front. You know what that's going to be, and that happens at the closing table. 
for years and years, and this is how I raised other people's money, we only made money off the points. We gave all the interest rate to the investor or the lender that was lending us their self-directed IRA money. IRA money. They got all the interest rate. We only collected the points and we built a really strong business off of it. So let me tell you a little bit about how we got started. Um, I was born a poor white child. So really, <laughs> I am a recovering mortgage broker. Tell all your friends. So I was a, a mortgage broker. Many of you know who Larry Goins is. He's a great speaker, a great teacher, great in real estate. Um, he hired me as a loan officer in his loan company, and he had three other loan officers. He happened to be the president of our local RIA meeting, our local real estate investor meeting. And the very first meeting that was there, I went to that meeting. I knew how to do investor loans, how to do investor conventional loans. They're the hardest ones to do. Most um, mortgage brokers don't like doing them because there's so much paperwork. And the underwriting is just a little bit different. It's tougher, because if you're not gonna make a mortgage payment, are you gonna make your investment property or your primary? You're going to make your primary. So the investment underwriting is a whole lot tougher. So I knew those loans. I knew how to underwrite them. I went to the first meeting that I went to while he was the president. I picked up 20 loans that month and he fired his other loan officers and he made me his partner. Yeah. <laughs> so that worked out for me. And then, then what happened is as I'm underwriting these loans, in order to send them to a conventional lender. I noticed that there were a lot of people who had plenty of money and a good job and could qualify for the loans, but they couldn't find any houses. And then I knew that there were other people that were really great at finding houses, today we call them wholesalers, really great at finding houses, but they couldn't qualify for a loan. So I thought to myself, hmm, how can we work this together? And that's when I started taking the people that had their money and lending their money to the people who didn't have it or couldn't qualify for the loan. And that's how I really fell into hard money. It fell right into my lap, thank you God. And from there it just took off. So one of the things that I would say when I got up in front of that real estate, um, that real estate meeting I would stand up and I would say, I do investor loans. And if you're not making 15% on your self-directed IRA, you need to see me. You think I had some fans from that? People were lining up in the hallway, waiting to ask how in the world I'm doing that. Even today, if I'm on an elevator, you know, everybody has an elevator pitch, right? So what do you do for a living? I help people build wealth. <laughs> And I don't say another word. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. How do you do that? I did everything I could to learn as much as I could about self-directed IRAs and how they work. If there's nothing else you get out of today, you need to listen to what Nate was telling you about learning how, IRA, how IRAs work, who you can lend to, who you can't lend to. All of the deals that you can do with it, I'm telling you, it will change your world. There are so many people. How many people even have an IRA in this room? Raise your hand. Awesome. Did, keep them raised. Keep them raised. Okay, everybody look around the room at the raised hands. There's your lenders right there. How are you doing? It's not a joke. How are you doing, she says. <laughs> it's not a joke. It's not a joke. You need to tell people you have money. And those of you who are looking for it, you need to tell people you're looking for money. And the way to do that is just like oh, several people talked about it, having a story. I think Mary said that too. You are just so amazing. She said that too. You need to have a story. Write this name of this book down. It's called Stories That Stick. I read it on the way up here. Anybody in here read that book yet? Oh, I'm the first. It's called Stories That Stick. Rebecca Lyons is the writer, and it's L-Y-O-N-S, of course, because there's more than one. 
it is an excellent book and what she talks about is how you can sell things by telling a story. A lot of people don't even care about the product. They just fall right into the story. So you need to have a story about who you are, how you got to where you are, and where you wanna go. Whether you're a borrower or a lender, you can bring people into your tribe and into your fold because of the story that you have to tell. And it needs to be the truth. Don't go making one up. Let it be the truth. You've got to have that story. So when people are asking me what I do for a living, I help people build wealth. And if they want to hear my story, I'll bend their ear as long as they want me to. And I'll tell them about the story, about how we lend money and how we change people's lives and how we help change communities just by lending money and allowing other people to blossom as well. It's a pretty cool thing. So that's how we got started. And I will tell you this, um, from when we started collecting money, other people's money, I had gotten to the point, this is before we did our fund, where I literally had $23 million of other people's self-directed IRA money. Not one dime of it was mine. But I was able to lend out that kind of money. That's, that's what you, you're capable of, of collecting. You're capable of raising that kind of money. You have to know what you're doing, and you have to treat that money even more important than your own. But you're absolutely capable of doing it. So. Here's some mistakes that you can make, and I'm gonna warn you about them and tell you don't do it. <laughs> Try to keep you safe. Never lend to family. Anybody do that? How many have lent to family before? How'd that work out for you? Nice. Not too good. Still yep. <laughs> there you go, Tommy. Same here. <laughs> I can tell you, even when I was a conventional lender, there were many people that I had to turn down for a loan because they lent money to their parents or their children or their uncle or their sister and they didn't pay the bill. Whenever you lend money to people, especially your family, they have every intention of paying you back, hopefully. But bad things happen to good people all the time. And it's really uncomfortable at Christmas dinner when you're sitting across the table from somebody who owes you money. It's really difficult, so be very, very careful about that. The other thing is never borrow money from family. Why am I saying that? I borrow money from my mom all the time, but she knows that I will do everything in my power to make sure she gets paid back before anything else, before my children eat. Sorry, son. <laughs> I will make sure that my mother gets paid back, but not everybody thinks that way. So be very, very careful about that. Um, let's see. You need to check out your borrower. I don't care how well you know this person. I don't care about how big of a hard money lender you are, how large or small the loan is. You need to do your due diligence on the borrower. And it's so easy to do. The first thing I do is I ask around about people all the time. All the time. And I can tell you that a lot of us hard money lenders ask each other. We talk. We talk. We share stories, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So you've got to do that borrower due diligence. You've got to find out the things about them. So we pull um, background checks, credit checks. I want to know how much cash they have on hand. So what do I care about the cash on hand? I, I was speaking to someone earlier today that's a lender in this room. And uh, we were talking about how much money they have to put out of pocket when they close. So. When we close a loan with somebody, we want to make sure that they have enough cash to make our payments. I'm checking their bank statements. I want to make sure that they have at least six months worth of money in the bank, not borrowing from somebody. I want to make sure they have six months worth of, of uh, payments in the bank to be able to make my payments for the next six months. That's just the starting point. I also want to make sure that they're bringing the money to the closing table. 
that they're not borrowing that from somebody. If they have a partner in the deal, that's fine. But I want to make sure that they're bringing that. Why do I care about that? I care about that because I want to see that they can manage their money and save their money. We lend 100% of what their purchase price and their rehab cost is. And there's a lot of hard money lenders out there and private money lenders that'll say I would never do that. We do it because I want to make sure that person has enough cash to pay me. I also want to make sure that they have enough cash to take care of the crap that happens when they're rehabbing a house. Has anybody in here ever rehabbed a house and not had something go wrong? <laughs> I take Fire. it, yeah. <laughs> Jerome says yes, but you know, he's different. <laughs> I have to tell you, we all know that there's that wall with termites, or it has some sort of water damage, or something's going on that you didn't expect. You know, the piers are carjacks, and the contractor didn't go underneath and look. Ask me how that one came to my mind. Um, there's all kinds of things that are gonna go wrong. I wanna make sure that that borrower has the cash to take care of that, because it's not in my rehab budget. I'm holding on to that rehab money. It's not in my rehab budget. And I'm not going to release any money to them so they can pay for it out of my money. My money's going to what's in the budget, what's in writing, right? So I want to make sure they have enough money to take care of the things that go wrong. You got a lot of people that'll say, well, I want to make sure they have skin in the game and um, I want to make sure they're really committed to what they're doing. You can figure all that out if they have experience, if you know their character. There's all kinds of other ways you can figure out whether or not that person is really sold out on this loan that, that they're getting ready to get from you. So, so that's why we care about having somebody that has money on hand. The other thing is, is we pull their background check because we want to see what their character is like. And I love the statement somebody said earlier about looking at social media. <laughs> Have you done that? It's scary. It's really scary. Sometimes I have to not look, but <laughs> for the most part, you really should be looking at those things. But when we pull a background check, we find out all kinds of stuff. Um, and I've told this story before. I'm going to do it again because it's so good. We pulled a background on a guy who had 22 seat belt violations in a two year period. How do you do that? Look at me, I don't have my seat belt on. You drive by the cops and flip them the bird. How, how do you do that? So, so my brother asked the guy, he said, um, I see you have a lot of seat belt violations here. Why is that? And he said, well, I just don't like following the rules. <laughs> and my brother said, well, we have rules. <laughs> and we like for people to follow them. So it's probably not a good fit for us. This guy had money in the bank. He had a 720 plus credit score. He would have been a great person to lend to. But we didn't lend to him because of his character. That was trouble waiting to happen. Trouble waiting to happen. So the other thing we care about, too, is the credit report. Now, there are also some things that will show up on a background check that don't necessarily show up on your credit report. Foreclosures are some of them. Bankruptcies are some of them. If Sometimes it doesn't show up on the credit report. It might be too old to show up on the credit report. There are liens that will show up on a background check that won't show up on a credit report. <coughs> People can get credit reports fixed. Did you know that? <coughs> Surprise! They're not always what you think they are. So some of those things can show up on a background check. The credit report is important to us too. We, we, we don't care if they've had to file bankruptcy in their past. We don't care that they've been through a foreclosure in the past. What we do care about is how long ago was that? And as Mary said, again, we go, go back to Mary. I'm just going to start saying, okay, what Mary said. <laughs> we care about how they handled it. That's what we're really interested in. Did you stick your head in the sand? Did somebody have to track you down to get you to make a payment? How did you handle that? What did you do to make it right? 
I can tell you that bad things that happen to people build really good character. I got character out the rear end, folks. <laughs> It builds character on how you handle things, and that's really what we care about. Um, judgments or liens. You have really got to be concerned about judgments and liens that are against people, because they follow them around like the plague. You need to make sure that it's cleaned up. A, a, lot, of people, a lot of people will say, well, I can show you that I'm making payments to the IRS. That's great. Are they making those payments? Is there still a lien against the property? Could it be possible that they'd stop making those payments and that it would catch up with them again? Yes, those possibilities are there. Be careful about things like that. When you're looking at making a loan to somebody, you need to ask yourself, am I okay with not getting any of this money back? <laughs> How comfortable does that make you? Not too comfortable, right? You need to ask yourself those questions. Every time we do a loan, every time we do a loan, we look at it as if we have to take it back tomorrow. Because that's always an option. And it's an option that we don't want. We don't want to have to go through that. People will say, well, gosh, you're lending me this money and you're asking me all these questions about how I'm going to pay it back? <laughs> I always think that's funny. Um, yeah, I care about it getting paid back. I don't want your house. If I wanted your house, I would be in the house flipping business. Remember, I'm not good at that. I'm not interested in doing that. I like having that seat at that table that has the fewest hours in the deal and I'm making the biggest profit. Anybody with me? You should all be going, yeah, I'm in, I'm in for that. So experience. Experience matters to us also. <laughs> I love going to these events, um, and it happens a lot, especially at your local RIA, where we'll have our little table, they'll walk up and, and say, yeah, I'm interested in hard money, tell me how it works, or tell me what you do. And I'll say, great, are you an investor? Yes, I am. Well, how many deals have you done? Well, I haven't done any yet, but. <laughs> we all have to start somewhere, right? We all have to start somewhere. I don't want to be the one lending you the money on your first deal. I'll just be honest. I don't want to be the one lending you the money on the first deal, but I'll tell you what I will do is I'll hold your hand and teach you what you need to know, and I'll point you in the right direction of all the people you, you need to hook up with to learn from, and I'll show you all the meetings you need to go to so that you can learn more and more. I will set you up so that you will be the best borrower that I have. Thank you. <laughs> All right, that's good. We'll see you later. <laughs> I do everything I can to make sure that you're educated because I don't want to do just one of your loans. I want to do them all. But I can't do that if you're not in business, right? So we've got to be able to, to, to teach people and show them what to do. So experience does matter. The property man matters as well. So we care about the borrower, we care about their ability to pay us back, we care about their character, but I also care about the property because I'm always thinking, hey, if I have to take this property back tomorrow, is it one I would want? Well, I can tell you right up front, no, I don't want any of them. But is it, is it one that I can get rid of quickly? Can I get rid of a piece of land real quickly? Not really. Can I get rid of a $300,000 um, fix and flip house pretty quick? Actually, I probably can, depending on where it is. How about one that's worth about 130 all day long? I can get rid of that house before I take it back. It can happen really, really fast. So I care about all of those things. Those are some of the things that, that make me do a loan on that property or make me say, sorry, I can't help you, but here's somebody who can. So how long will it take for me to sell a property when I have to take it back? That's the, that's the number one question for us. How long, not can I sell it, but how long will it take? Am I making money off of holding on to a property? The answer to that is no. I'm making money when somebody's paying me interest on that property. 
that's where we make our money. So we want to make sure we get our money back as quickly as possible so we can turn around and lend it to somebody else. Because money makes money. Right? So <laughs> the price range in your market is really, really important. Now, we lend in the southeast, all over the southeast. And I know that houses that where they have to repair values over about 500,000, for the most part, is going to sit. Is anybody else feeling that? Yes. Yeah. So in 2000, January 2019, a year ago, we completely <coughs> changed who and what we were lending on in a big way. We completely changed it, and we changed it for a reason, because we know that there's a pendulum swinging back and forth, right? We've been riding on what, a 10-year high, 11-year high right now? You think it's going to swing back anytime soon? If you don't, you're a fool, because <laughs> it's going to happen. And we want to make sure that we're in a position where if everything crashes around me, I know that I can rent a $200,000 house and still pay my investors 6 or 7% interest, but I can't do that with a $500,000 house or a million dollar house, right? So we're protecting ourselves for what we know is coming down the pike at some point. My crystal ball broke in 2008, you know, broke a lot of things in 2008. <laughs> In fact, just the word broke in 2008 was pretty common <laughs> because a lot of people were. But it was also a great opportunity for the people who knew it was coming down the pike, for the people who were really paying attention to what was going on, for the people who had cash, for the people who were smart enough to hold on to enough cash that when they saw everything crash, they started buying up. <coughs> and I envy those people. And this time, I'm going to be one of those people. How many people in this room were in business in 2008 and 9? Do you remember what happened? There's a lot of new people who weren't. And you need to remember, you, you need to talk to somebody who remembers what happened. Because it was tough. It was really, really tough. So care about the price range in your market. You know, uh, one of the things I don't want is to have the biggest house in a neighborhood. I don't want to lend money on the biggest house in the neighborhood. Do you know why that is? Those bigger houses get less per square foot than the smaller houses do per square foot. And when that appraisal's coming in, sometimes that appraisal won't won't take into account that it's the biggest house in the neighborhood. They're going to go outside the neighborhood and use bigger comps, houses that are bigger for comps. That's not really a true comp. You need to stick within the neighborhood and understand. I know that if I'm buying property and I'm spending $300,000 on a house and I'm in a neighborhood where all the other houses are $200,000, I don't want to spend $300,000 on a house that's in a neighborhood with $200,000 houses. I don't want to be the biggest house in the neighborhood. I want to be the smallest house in the neighborhood. And I want to rent it out as an Airbnb, but that's a whole nother thing. Okay, the other thing is, is we want to make sure that the house or product that you're buying is the highest and best use for what it is you're buying. I can't tell you how many times that I've gotten people that apply for loans, they send us their repair list, and when they go to fix it up, there is a $100,000 house and they're putting granite countertops in there. <coughs> when everybody else in the neighborhood has laminate. It doesn't make sense. Make sure that what you're doing is the highest and best use. Are you gonna put a single family house in the middle of a bunch of duplexes? Mm-mm. Stay vanilla. Make it look like everybody else. Um, let's see. Oh, and I started talking about that. Vanilla. Do you like the flavor of vanilla? I love the flavor of vanilla. <laughs> it's plain. It's safe. I like that it's with everybody else. I don't mind being that way. Vanilla can be good. 
Do you have vanilla in that plate? Huh? <laughs> I got it right here. You got it right. You got your vanilla right there. <laughs> he likes vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> Vanilla is as fancy as I want to get. <laughs> it's, it's, your appraisals come in uh, so much better when you're in a neighborhood where all the other houses look alike. When all the other houses are similar, people buy in a certain neighborhood because they like the neighborhood, they like the style of houses, they like those home sizes, they want it to look alike. I don't want to buy the house that looks odd in the middle of a neighborhood. I want to make sure that it fits in with everything else. You also want to have some functional, good functional utility. I remember we were getting ready to do a loan on a house, and it was so funny the first time I went in to inspect it and release money. It was a really cool house that was, you know, colonial, column, you know, Terra. It looked like Terra from, uh, what's that movie? Gone with the Wind. It was really, really cool, but it was built into a hill. So the front was, you could see how beautiful the front was, but the back was kind of stuck up against this hill. So the back half of the house wasn't really there. Does that make sense? When you walked into that house, there was a bathroom at the back of the house. Well, to get to the bathroom, you went to, down this hallway and you opened up the door. And when you walked in, the toilet was up a step. You literally had to walk in there, back up, step up, and sit down. <laughs> it was a little odd. Odd things like that are hard to resell. How many times do you want to walk through a kitchen to get to a bedroom to get to a bedroom? You have to make sure it's functional. You have to make sure it's functional. Um, here's another good one that I really love. You may notice this or you may not. And I got this from Robin Thompson. But the first three houses in the neighborhood are the harsh, hardest ones to sell. First three houses on the street, they're the busiest ones. They have all the car traffic. They're great rental properties, excellent rental properties. But they're the hardest ones to sell because they're on the busiest part of the street. I never realized that till I heard her say that. And I started thinking, you know what? She's right. Absolutely right. That always makes me a little nervous. The other thing is a busy street. There's a lot of times when you will have an appraiser pull comps for you, and when they pull those comps, they'll pull comps from all the neighborhood behind the house, but your house is the one on the busy street. You need to go ahead and take ten, twenty thousand dollars off the price of that house because of the busy road. Ask me how I know. Ask me how many horseshoe driveways I've put in to get a house sold. Nice little places where they could turn around. The only way you could get them sold. So understand that that is there. That's a, that can be a big problem. Oh, the other thing too. I must have hit this. Did I? Have I been hitting stuff? <laughs> okay, that's the other way. <laughs> Anybody want an encore? <laughs> oh, is it the property management slide? Oh, this one. Is that it? Okay, then I'm going to go to what? View. Slideshow. Is that it? It looks really funky up here, I'm sorry. Okay, so now we'll go back to where I was. Okay, everybody just take a deep breath. Let me give you something to talk about. Uh, okay, so <laughs> this is where we were done, right? Okay, stay involved. I can't tell you how important it is for you as a lender to stay involved in the deal that you've loaned money on. Don't ever lend money and walk away and think that nothing's gonna go wrong. 
and think that you're gonna get all your payments on time and think that the rehab is going right and think that they're on time with what they're doing, they've probably gone through three or four contractors and it could be their fault or the contractors, but you know, the shoe fits. You gotta make sure that you are involved in that loan. You know what, you should do it to help the borrower to begin with. You probably have more experience than your borrower. There are so many times when you can help them walk through a situation that they've never been through that will make them a better borrower. You want to be, them to be a good borrower because you want your money back so you can lend them more money, right? One of the things that's really helped me too is I'm a, I have had my real estate broker's license since 1982. I was 12. Um, <laughs> but I've had that license for a long time. But, you know, it's one of those things where my mother said, you need something to fall back on. You have to ha anybody have their mothers do that for you? It's a great thing. And I'm glad that she did because it has really helped me. I've, fa I've fallen back on it many, many, many times. But knowing that, I also am on MLS, I'm in a bunch of houses every week, and I know what's selling and what's not selling. <clears throat> you know, I can convince people, hey, you don't want to keep that loft in the den anymore. It's a really cool spiral staircase, but guess what, people don't like that. And there are little things. Do you remember when they were building houses in the 80s and you didn't have a bathroom door in your master bedroom? It was like an opening and your shower would be on one side with a door, the toilet would be on the other side with a door, and the vanity would be basically stuck in the master bedroom. Remember that style? Yeah, yeah she's hating it. I, yeah, you remember it. All I did was say, hey, you want to put a door right here and take those two walls out, look how big your bathroom is, and it'll sell a lot quicker. They never thought of it. And it was a $1,000 cost to their rehab to do it. But what it did to get their house sold so much quicker, that was the lender, real estate person in me, the real estate agent lender going in and saying, hey, you need to give this a shot. Changed everything for them. So when we lend money, we keep all the funds in our account. I would love to give you all of the rehab money, but I don't feel like writing you in the Caribbean. <laughs> I would much rather control that money. There are many reasons why we control that money. If somebody gives me a draw on the um, 29th of the month, guess what they're doing a draw for, really? They want to use my draw money to make their payment. That's not going to flush for me. We don't release money within five days of, of uh, a mortgage being due. And it's, it's easy, to, I tell them that right up front. Within five days, we will not give you your draw money. So if you want to draw, you need to do it way in advance or you need to go ahead and make your payment and then we'll release the money to you. Because that's not what that draw money is for. That draw money is to pay a contractor. So we want to control that money. We want to see where it's going and what's happening with it. And it's so easy for you to just borrow a little bit of money from Paul to pay Peter. It doesn't work. It doesn't work and it catches up with them. We inspect all the work. We have an independent company that we use now, but at one point it was me going into every single property and looking at what they were doing. I know a lot of, of lenders that will take pictures from the person that's doing the rehab. That is stupid. <laughs> In fact, it's stupid, stupid, stupid. I can take a picture of a room and make it look really good and make it look like it's completely rehabbed. It's just that one corner, but the rest of the house is a mess. You need to go in there and look. I've had cabinets that were put into, shape, into place in the kitchen. It looks so good, not one of them was screwed in. I've had them get on a truck and leave. It happens. It happens. You need to make sure not only what's been done, but what's left to do. Do I still have enough money in that rehab budget to finish this house? Did they decide to do a little bit more than they originally intended? And do I have enough money to finish that? Because if I have to take it back tomorrow, I've got to finish that. That puts me in that loan deeper than that 70% that I was counting on. 
And now what happened? The profit has dissolved on that property. So not only do we care about what they're doing, we care about what's left to be done. And then we also care about the quality. Come on, the quality, really? It's amazing what you can do with duct tape. <laughs> I've seen people try to cover holes with duct tape and paint it. You can tell. <laughs> The other thing that really drives me crazy is when people are still buying the Hollywood lights for the bathroom. They're at least 10 bucks at Lowe's, right? The strip of lights and they have the bulbs in them. Don't do that anymore. People don't even buy them from Habitat for Humanity anymore. <laughs> don't use those. Don't use those. So the other thing we do is we get our, our borrowers to have their contractors sign a release waiver when we release money. We care about that because when I have to take that house back, I need to prove that that guy's been paid because we release the money to the borrower. We don't pay the contractor. How do you know that that borrower's paying the contractor by that little piece of paper that says they've been paid? Make sure you do that, it's real simple. Um, review, approve, and reference the scope of work. So I am always amazed at the people that think you can rehab a bathroom for $500. But my cousin's going to do all the work. Well, that's great. Your cousin won't do that work for me when I take it back, will he? You need to have some realistic figures on that budget. Don't just look at it. Don't just glance at it and throw it down. You really know, need to know what it costs to rehab a kitchen, to do a full bath, to do a half bath. How much does it cost to move plumbing from one place to another? Is it, is, is it really only $800 to side an entire house? I don't think so. I don't care what kind of deal you're getting. It's probably not that. The other thing is all the way in the other direction. It does not cost $13,000 to replace a toilet. <laughs> right? The government thinks it does. So if you're a government contractor, you're doing really well on that. <laughs> but you, you need to know what it costs to do these repairs or have an idea of what it costs to do those repairs so that you can make sure that your borrower is giving you some real numbers on that. Okay. Now we're going to talk about being a borrower. Everybody got the lender part down, down pat? Yeah? Okay, so we're going to talk about being a borrower. Here's my first clue that I want you to just take home and sleep on. If you take a deal to a lender and you have that great story about this property and that lender says, no, I am not going to lend on that property, there's probably a pretty good reason for that. And it could be that the deal stinks. It could be that there's something wrong with that deal, especially if you take it to a second lender and they tell you the same thing. If a lender's not going to do it, then it's probably not a good deal. You think? Absolutely, there's a reason for that, but ask them questions. If you get turned down for any kind of a loan, you need to ask why. What could I have done different? What would be different about this deal that would make you do it? What is a red flag that popped up for you on this deal? Ask them those questions. They'll share it with you. They'll tell you. Did you have the right story when you presented the deal? I can't tell you how many people call me and say, hey, I want a loan on this property, and my first question is, What's the after repaired value and how much is the rehab? And when I say, what is the after repaired value? And they go, uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, talk to you later. <laughs> That's the most important number for anybody to know. What that after, how do you know what to offer? How do you know what to offer? And my second question, What's it going to cost to fix it up? Uh, I don't know. 
Duh, is it 40,000 or 4,000? There's a little bit of a difference there. I know it's just a zero, but there's a little bit of a difference there. It makes all the difference in the world as to whether or not it's a deal. How many people are buying properties on auction? Are you getting into those houses before you buy them? Yeah. I hear some yes, you're not supposed to, so I'm not gonna ask you how you got in. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> Listen, if you can't go into a house and see what kind of shape it's in, you are taking a huge chance. Now, if you are a really experienced rehabber and you just go ahead and do a rehab estimate based on square footage and you know what you're doing, then you have at it and good luck to you. But if you're even a little bit new in this business buying off of an auction, you are setting yourself up for a ride and it's probably downhill. You need to be really, really careful about that. I have had people buy property off, off of an auction. She comes to me for a loan. I said, you have to go inside and see what, it, what what's in there. You can't close on this property without going inside. <laughs> I have to have an appraiser. The appraiser has to go inside to do an appraisal, right? So she did something that I thought was pretty darn smart. She went to a neighbor's house, next door neighbor, to the house that she bought on auction, where somebody was still living in the house, by the way, because now she's responsible for getting them out, right? She went to the neighbor, neighbor to ask about the, the person she was buying, the, the person's house. First question she wanted to know, is this person nuts? Am I gonna get up on the front porch and they're gonna pull a gun on me, right? So she finds out that that person is a really nice person and that when a lot of people who are in foreclosure, they don't ask for these things. You know, the bad things are happening and, and you have to have some compassion for these folks. She went and knocked on the front door, told her how sorry she was that they were going through what they were going through and that she was the one that was getting the house and would they allow her to walk through the property and look at it found out what their need was and then offered them cash to get out. And they took it and she was good. She worked it out perfectly. And then there are other people who just use credit cards in the back door. <laughs> Gotta be careful with that, you can get in trouble. <laughs> okay, so if the lender says no, it's probably not a good deal. You wanna check your due diligence as a borrower. I don't have to teach anybody how to do that, right? You should be doing the same due diligence that a lender is doing. And the lender should be doing the same due diligence that you're doing. Because the outcome is the same. The work is the same. The deal is the same. Both have to be important. Another one is to pay vendors what they're worth. I am an investor, I am cheap. Everybody say that. I am an investor, I am cheap. It's who we are. Who pays full price for anything? I love flea markets. Anybody with me? I love to be able to go to these Caribbean islands and um, just dicker with them. See how cheap, I might even not even want it, but I want to see how cheap I can get it. <laughs> That's fun to me. It's fun to me. You too? That's right. <laughs> It's, it's fun to me. It's natural for us to do this. Here's what I've learned to have to fight this problem that I have, is I know that I have to pay vendors what they're worth. I would much rather pay a sheetrock guy a little bit more than what I would normally pay if he's gonna hang it right, if he does it right the first time, and if he messes up that he'll be there the very next day to fix it. I would much rather pay an electrician that's gonna pass inspection the first time that guy comes through. I would much rather have a plumber that doesn't leave me with leaks. How many times have you put in a shower pan that goes right to the crawl space? First time they use the shower. Trying to cut corners, she's shaking her head. I bet that happened. It's happened to me. Pay people what they're worth. The other thing is, is if you pay people what they're worth, they will be the first one on your job when you have work for them. Every time, and right now, it's hard to find a good contractor, isn't it? Yeah. It's hard to find people you can count on. You know what, you don't pay them on Fridays because then you know they won't show up on Monday, right? 
you want to make sure that you find people that are good and you pay them what they're worth. They deserve a living too. You're making a profit, they should make a profit too. They got families to feed. It's a win-win for everybody if you're looking at it the same way. Very, very important. The other thing is it's important to get your bids detailed and in writing. And if that means I need to count how many outlets are going to be replaced, then count them. If I have to put a brand name on the type of sinks and bathtubs and toilets I want in, then put that down there. Don't assume that you're on the same page. Because there's a very big difference between a $99 toilet and a $200 toilet. There's a big difference. There's a big difference between a $100 vanity and a $300 vanity. There's a big difference. They all serve their own purpose. There are certain houses you're going to put those different products in, but make sure you're on the same page with the person that's giving you the bid. And it's even more important to make sure that your vendors are comparing apples to apples when they're giving you a bid. Don't go with this guy because he's the cheapest. There's a reason for that. Could be because he's got a whole bunch of duct tape and he knows how to paint over it. So watch out for that. Um, multiple baskets. You know, the last thing that anybody in this room should think is that they can't do any deals because they don't have any money to borrow. There is more money out there for you to borrow than there's ever been. How many people have self-directed IRAs? Raise your hands. There's your lenders. And that's just the beginning. If you sit down and talk to Lori Eubanks, ask her about seller financing. That's how that girl got started, from seller financing. And don't think you can only seller finance houses. Apartment complexes, mobile home parks, commercial building. We just bought a commercial building in Rock Hill, South Carolina. We just bought the old post office. It was built in the 1800s. They moved it in 1906 by horse and carriage to the place it is now. We got 4% interest rate from the seller over 20 years. Uh, no, it's going to be our office. <laughs> our office is going to be an Airbnb. But it's, what's amazing is the terms that you can get. It's so easy to pick up. And, and the thing about seller financing, too, is you never know why that person needs the money that they're asking and what they're going to do for it, do with the money. And you know how you find out? You ask them, what are you going to do with the money? How much money do you need? Sometimes, oh, I just want to get a boat, or I got to put my kid through college, or I just got a divorce and I've got to put a down payment on this house. Everybody has a reason as to why they're trying to sell this thing. Find out what it is. Sometimes you're coming across uh, burned out landlords, right? They want to have the income, but they don't want to have to mess with the toilets and the trash, right? Well, this is a great opportunity for them to continue to get income, but now you own the property. You've got, you've got to put that thought into their mind because they're not going to think of it themselves. You also want to diversify your lenders. I would love to be the lender of everybody in this room. Please, but I am not your only hope. I know it's hard to believe. There are plenty of good lenders out there. You need to have private money. You need to have hard money. You need to have institutional money. You need to have um, seller finance money. All of these are great options to have, and every deal you buy will be a different personality that will match that money perfectly. And you have to figure out what that is. It's kind of like putting together a puzzle. Oh, this is a great little house. What's the best financing option for this house? My first thought is always seller financing. If I can't get the seller financing, then what are my other options? I need to close this house really quick. The only way for me to do that is to go with a private money lender or a hard money lender. 
you've got to stay diverse in all the people that you're borrowing from. Don't just choose one person. People run out of money too. There are hard money lenders out there that run out of money. And I, I mean, even it, we run out of money. I hate to tell somebody that I can't do a loan because I don't have any money. I can tell you every hard money lender or every private money lender will tell you the same thing. We, we don't make money saying no, right? So seller financing. Here's the other thing. We talked about a, how important it is to have a story. You want to show off your successes. You should have a notebook of all of the properties you've done. You should have pictures. Even if you have pictures of the people that you bought it from or the people that you sold it to, tell their story. People love stories. You should have what you bought it for, what you put into it, what you paid for it, and how long it took you to do it. We lenders love lending money, but we want to know when we're going to get our money back. Not only that we're going to get it back, but when. How long is it going to take me to get my money back? Those stories are perfect for you. Just keep adding them in. Carry it with you. Show it off. Did you mess up and lose money? Anybody lose money in this business? Okay, if you haven't raised your hand, you're a liar. And if you haven't lost money, I'm here to tell you you will. Yeah, you will. Isn't that great? We can all close down now. You will lose money. The key is what did you do to take care of it? What was your character like when you fixed it? What did you learn from it? That's key, and that's a story for you to tell in your book. Here's where I really screwed up, and let me tell you what I did, and what I'll never do again. That's real, it's real stuff. It makes you real to that person. It changes everything for them. The other thing is to keep reserves on hand. I had one, two, three. I've had four calls this week. What's today? Thursday. Four calls this week for people wanting to borrow money because they have run out. They used all their cash to rehab a house. And they have no money left. Guess what? When you do a loan, you have to pay for something. Closing costs are something, right? Don't back yourself into a corner to where you don't have reserves. Most of the people that borrow from us can pay cash for everyone they buy. But they choose to be smart about it and keep their cash on hand so they can buy another property, so they can take care of incidents that happen that they don't expect. You should always have cash reserves. Here's my, one of my very favorites is don't ever force or rush a deal. I have been doing this for 20 years. Good deals come along every single day, every day. Even in 2008 and 2009, good deals come along every day. If somebody calls me and says, I gotta close this loan and I gotta do it in three days. Okay, well you have fun with that. <laughs> Sometimes it's just God saying not now. Sometimes it's just not meant to be. And if, if you have to do things that are out of the ordinary to make a deal close, it might not be the deal you need to be in. Let somebody else have it. It should be easier for you than that. Don't force it. Don't rush it. It needs to come naturally. Okay, let's see what else we got. Here's one of the things I really want to share, and I think I'm like almost at my end. I am. So, um, Jim talked a little bit about how I shared my time. How much time, time do I have? How much time? I'm good? Oh, okay, five minutes. I don't know if I can do this in five minutes. Okay. So, <laughs> so there are a couple things that I do. You know, when we changed everything in January of 2019 in our business, one of the other things that we did is we committed our company to God as our CEO. We gave it up. Thank you. <laughs> we, we figured he had a lot more experience than we did and that his decisions are pretty good. So, so we just said, you know what, we're going to make decisions that are right, 
even if they don't make us money. We're going to make sure that what we're doing is on the path that He wants us on. And we, we go to prayer in everything that we do. Um, sometimes we curse about things that we do, but most of the times we go. So, so one of the things that I committed to, because I stole this from somebody else that I highly respect, his name is Jeff Johnson. He's in the Good Success Mastermind with Tom. He was doing a Tuesday afternoon. How many people, and if you're experienced, you're going through this too. Can I just take you out for coffee and pick your brain for a little while? Okay. Or I'll take, take you out to lunch, and then they take you out, and they don't even pay for it. That's kind of bad, but. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of people will want your time. I love to teach. I love to share what I know. I am so high on this business, it's just, it's awesome. I get excited when I'm driving down the street and I see a for sale sign that says under contract. I don't know who they are, but I'm happy for them. You know, it's another deal. I love seeing new construction. I love seeing things grow. I, I love this business. I love to see people go from nothing and become successful. Yes. I love to see that take place. And I'm really excited if I can help them do that. So I want to meet with these people and share with them what I know. But I ain't got time for that. <laughs> it's hard to do that when you're running a company and you're, you're, you're trying to do, yeah, I, I actually have a family. I have a husband and three kids and we live on a farm. I have chickens to feed. It's hard. It's really hard. It's not harder than cleaning out the chicken coop, but that's a whole nother story. It, it's, it's hard to fit everything in, so I want to do that. So my friend Jeff Johnson, said he solved it by going to Panera Bread on Tuesdays and would tell people, if you want to talk to me, I'm at Panera Bread on Tuesdays between three and whatever time he picked, and they would show up and wait in line to talk to him. And sometimes all he did was just pray with them. So I said, you know what, I'm going to steal that. I have Wednesday with Wendy. <laughs> it kind of matches, doesn't it? So every Wednesday from 10 until 3 p.m., I go across the street to our bakery. It's called Amelie's. And I have a calendar, a link at my, at my email. So if you send me an email, you can hook up too. So I go across there, and I book an hour appointment from 10 until 3 p.m. And I have seen 176 people in the year of 2019. How awesome is that? <laughs> so cool. And, and here's the real kicker about it, is I can't believe what I have learned. It is amazing what I have learned. It's amazing what people are bringing to the table. What else is cool is that I am so blessed to be in these incredible um, meetings, to go on cruises, to be in Freedom Founders, all the masterminds that I'm involved with, to be able to, to take the people that I meet locally and the ones on the phone, because some of them are virtual, and be able to hook them up with people that I know all over the country. And let them think outside of their little Charlotte, North Carolina mind. It's so cool to see people grow like that. Um, and I don't get business when I meet these people. I don't get business from them. Every great once in a while I do, but that's not what it is. It comes in the back door. It, it comes in the back door from different referrals, and it, it's just amazing how it's grown. Absolutely amazing. In addition to that, for the past 17 years, um, I have been facilitating a group called Sunrisers. We are a faith-based real estate group, and we meet at 7 a.m. every Friday morning for 17 years. We'll have anywhere from 50 to 55 people that show up. We have 800 people on our email list when we're reminding them of the meeting. There is, it's amazing. Ken and Ginger have been several times. How many people have been to my Sunrisers group that are in here? Oh, yay, look at all that. <laughs> it is, the people that are in there are so talented. Anybody in that room could run the whole meeting. All I have to do is ask one question, and they'll all start talking. I just sit down. It's amazing what they know and what they share, but what's really cool is when you sit and you break bread across the table with somebody, you know what they're doing for a living. You know what zip code they like to buy in. You know that that person is a wholesaler. You know that they like mobile home parks. 
and you just share deals back and forth. You partner on stuff. Hey, I'm brand spanking new. I've got this lot. I hear you're a builder. Will you help me? Heck yeah, they'll help them. It's amazing the business that they do with each other. A lot of them lend to each other because there's plenty of people who might have seventy, a hundred thousand dollars in a self-directed IRA, but they don't want to buy houses in their self-directed IRA. That's not necessarily the smartest thing to do. They can lend that money to them. And then that person might have seventy to a hundred thousand dollars in their self-directed IRA. Guess what they're doing with it? They're lending to somebody else that they know. It's just a great way to share. So I highly, highly recommend that you find a group similar to that where you are. If you're ever in Charlotte, come see us. We're there every Friday morning. Um, but it's just been a, a great way to give time back. And what I've found is that my time is so freed up now. I, I almost don't know what to do with myself. It's crazy. <laughs> I have an incredible team in place. I am so blessed with some awesome, awesome people. And I really screw things up when I go in and try to run stuff. So they keep me off in the corner and they take care of business. And they do a great job. And none of that would have, would have happened if I had not let go and let God handle it. So if I give you anything that you can take with you is give it up give it up and ask for help because you'll get it thank you so very much for your time i appreciate it <laughs>